Hello everyone, welcome back to another session in Dentistry and more. So topic for today is trauma from occlusion in periodontology. So as we all know, occlusal force is a critical factor which affects the condition and structure of the periodontium. Actually the periodontal ligament and alveolar bone require mechanical stimulation from the occlusal forces in order to remain structurally sound so that is an essential force but when this function is insufficient what happens is this tissues undergoes atrophy and when occlusal forces exceed the physiologic adaptive capacity of the tissues they cause damage such damage is referred to as trauma from occlusion so normally the bone and periodontal ligament has a capacity to withstand a level of force but beyond that level this force will result in injuring the tissues and the bone so that is known as trauma from occlusion so trauma from occlusion or TFO it's also known as traumatizing occlusion occlusal trauma traumatogenic occlusion periodontal traumatism or overload so the adaptive capacity of the periodontium to occlusal forces varies in different persons and in the same person at different times and is influenced by the magnitude direction duration and frequency of the force so regarding magnitude there will be change in periodontal ligament space that is widening happens and there will be increase in width of periodontal fibers and also an increase in density of alveolar bone will be seen with respect to the magnitude whereas the direction the changing the direction of occlusal forces causes reorientation of stresses within the periodontium so these fibers are arranged so that they best accommodate the occlusal forces So compared to the vertical forces, the lateral forces and torque are more likely to injure the periodontium. And regarding the duration and frequency of force, the constant pressure on the bone is more injurious than intermittent forces, but also more frequent the application of intermittent force, the more injurious is a force to periodontium. So the definition of trauma from occlusion by Carranza 11th edition When occlusal forces exceed the adaptive capacity of the tissues, tissue injury results. The resultant injury is termed as trauma from occlusion. And there are many types of uh, definitions given by various textbooks, Stillman, WHO, Glossary of uh, periodontal term that is AAP 1986 Lindy 5th edition but this is the simplest definition that is the occlusal forces exceeds adaptive capacity of the tissue which causes injury now the types of trauma from occlusion so basically we can classify it as acute or chronic or primary or secondary trauma from occlusion so the acute trauma from occlusion it develops from abrupt occlusal impact this is acute in nature such as biting on a hard food or restorations or prosthetic appliances that interfere with or alter the direction of occlusal forces that results in acute TFO the clinical features uh, it can vary from person to person tooth pain sensitivity to percussion and increased tooth mobility so it, it can uh, result in uh, shift in tooth position wearing of tooth structure correction of restoration uh, sometimes it heals and subsides but sometimes in some persons it results in periodontal injury that is necrosis and abscess or cementum tear happens whereas a chronic TFO which is more common and significant which uh, happens in a slow manner over a period of time that is a gradual changes by tooth wearing 
drifting movement and extrusion or by the parafunctional habits malocclusion is not necessarily a trauma from occlusion that is chronic and acute in nature whereas a primary and secondary tfo trauma from occlusion may be caused by alteration in occlusal forces or reduced capacity of the periodontium to withstand occlusal forces or both so when trauma from occlusion is a result of alteration in occlusal forces okay alteration in occlusal forces so occlusal force itself is altered which is known as primary trauma from occlusion but when it results from reduced ability of the tissue to resist the occlusal forces which is known as secondary okay this is primary whereas the occlusal forces is altered but in secondary what happens is the tissue is not having the normal capacity to withstand the forces it has compromised uh, tissue structure so that is resulting in secondary trauma from occlusion that is the reduced ability of the tissue to resist the occlusal forces here the structure is normal in primary structure is normal whereas at secondary the structure is not normal it is compromised so primary tfo which includes a tissue reaction that is a damage which is elicited around a tooth with normal height of periodontium it occurs if the trauma from occlusion is considered the primary etiological factor in periodontal destruction and occlusion results in only local alteration of teeth and parafunctional habits can also result in primary tfo So common example for primary TFO is uh, the periodontal injury happens around the teeth with previously healthy periodontium after a filling or uh, insertion of a prosthetic replacement which creates excessive force on abutment and antagonist teeth or drifting movement or extension of teeth into space created by unreplaced missing teeth or orthodontic movement of teeth into functionally unacceptable positions so changes produced by the primary trauma do not alter the level of connective tissue attachment and do not initiate pocket formation so there is no pocket so the secondary trauma from occlusion it occurs when the adaptive capacity of the tissues to withstand the occlusal forces is impaired so the capacity of the normal periodontium is not there so it is impaired and it is happened because of bone loss uh, which results from marginal inflammation and it is previously well tolerated occlusal forces now become traumatic because of the change in the bone pattern or periodontal structure So how exactly this trauma causes problem to the periodontal tissues The first thing is we need to learn about the gingival inflammation pathway to the alveolar bone So gingival inflammation which uh, leads to collagen fiber bundles then the blood vessels then the alveolar bone that is a pathway of gingival inflammation and interproximally through the vessels which perforates the crest of the interdental septum and directly into the periodontal ligament from there into the interdental septum and also facially and lingually which spreads along the outer periosteal surface and penetrates into the marrow space ultimately it destroys the transeptal gingival fiber and once the bone is reached that is the gingival inflammation reaches the bone which spreads into marrow space and replaces the marrow with exudate so bone resorption proceeds from within the marrow spaces 
so it results in thinning of bony trabeculae and enlargement of the marrow spaces and ultimately bone destruction and reduction of bone height and fatty bone marrow replaced with fibrous marrow so there are two concepts uh, which was put forward the first one by glickman so glickman said the pathway so the glickman concept the glickman concept of inflammation there is a pathway of spread of plaque associated gingival lesion can be changed if forces of an abnormal magnitude are acting on teeth harboring subgingival plaque so glickman said the force has an impact in changing the spread of inflammation that is a plaque associated gingival lesion so it implies that the character of progressive tissue destruction of periodontium at a traumatized tooth is different from that in a non traumatized tooth so this trauma or this abnormal force has a significant role in spreading the lesion so instead of an even destruction of the periodontium and alveolar bone that is uh, the supra bony pockets and horizontal bone loss according to glickman that is occurs at sites with uncomplicated plaque associated lesion sites which are also exposed to abnormal occlusal force will develop angular bony defect and infra bony pocket so normally without these forces it would have the horizontal bone loss and the normal uh, supra bony pockets but in the presence of an abnormal occlusal force with this plaque associated lesion will result in angular bony defect and infra bony pockets so he explained in zone of irritation and zone of co destruction with respect to this concept that is this part is zone of irritation and this is zone of destruction so zone of uh, irritation which includes the marginal and interdental gingiva that is a soft tissue of this zone is bordered by hard tissue that is a tooth on uh, only on one side and is not affected by force of occlusion so because the tooth is only on the uh, one side this means that the gingival inflammation cannot be induced by trauma from occlusion but is a result of irritation from microbial plaque so the plaque associated lesion at a non traumatized tooth propagates in the apical direction by first involving the alveolar bone and only later the periodontal ligament area and the progression of this lesion results in an e1 that is a horizontal bone destruction and the zone of co destruction which includes the pdl root cementum and alveolar bone coronally which is demarcated by the transeptal and the dendro alveolar collagen fibers the trauma from occlusion may cause a lesion here in the zone of co destruction not in the zone of irritation so this part the fiber bundles which separates the zone of co destruction from this irritation can be affected from two different direction that is from the inflammatory lesion maintained by the plaque of zone of irritation or from the trauma induced changes in the zone of co destruction so through this exposure from two different direction the fiber bundles may become dissolved and or oriented in a direction parallel to the root surface and the spread of an inflammatory lesion from the zone of irritation directly down in the periodontal ligament that is not via the interdental bone so this alteration of normal pathway of spread of plaque associated inflammatory lesion results in the development of angular bony defect that was a glickman concept whereas a verhoeck's concept in 1979 where hoax concept 
he refuted the hypothesis that trauma from occlusion played a role in the spread of gingival lesion into the zone of co-destruction which was highlighted by Glickman. He didn't accept it. He measured in addition the distance between the subgingival plaque and the periphery of associated inflammatory cell infiltrate in the gingiva and the surface of the adjacent alveolar bone and he concluded that the ankylar defects and infrabony pockets occurs equally frequent in teeth with TFO and in teeth without TFO. So Glickman said when there is an abnormal force it results in ankylar bony defects and infra bony pockets but warehouse says there is no difference in the presence of a abnormal occlusal force he says it happens both with and without the abnormal force that is a tfo has not much role in spreading the lesion or infection so the loss of connective tissue attachment and the resorption of bone around teeth are exclusively the result of inflammatory lesion associated with subgingival plaque there is no role for the tfo and he concluded that angular bony defects and these intra bony pockets occur when the subgingival plaque of one tooth has reached a more apical level than the microbiota on the neighboring tooth and when the volume of the alveolar bone surrounding the roots is comparatively large so when comparing two teeth at the same time when one happens at a more accelerated fashion there will be angular bony defect so where hoax and glickman's concepts are entirely contradicting so what are the stages of tissue response to increased occlusal force so tissue response so tissue response to increased occlusal force that is stage one is injury then stage two is repair then stage 3 is adaptive remodeling so these are three changes when there is increased occlusal force happens injury repair and adaptive remodeling so stage 1 injury which is caused by the excessive occlusal force under the force of occlusion or the tooth rotates around a fulcrum which creates pressure and tension on opposite sides of fulcrum so slight excessive pressure stimulates the resorption of alveolar bone with compression of pdl fibers and the excessive tension causes the elongation of pdl fibers and apposition of alveolar bone so in areas of increased pressure blood vessels are numerous and reduced in size and in increased tension they are enlarged so when there is greater pressure there will be compression of fibers which produce hyalinization and injury to fibroblasts and other connective tissue cells leads to necrosis. Then the vascular changes that is within 30 minutes there will be retardation and stasis of blood flow in 2 to 3 hours. There will be blood vessels posed with erythrocytes. 1 to 7 days there will be disintegration of the blood vessel walls. When there is severe tension happens there will be widening of the PDL, thrombosis, hemorrhage, tearing of the PDL, ligament and resorption of alveolar bone. So the areas of periodontium most susceptible to injury from excessive occlusal forces are the furcation areas. And injury to the periodontium produces a temporary depression in the mitotic activity and the rate of proliferation of fibroblasts, collagen and bone formation. So that was stage 1. Now we have repair that is stage 2. So it is constantly occurring in normal periodontium and trauma from occlusion stimulates increased reparative capacity or the activity. The damaged tissues are removed and new connective tissue cell, fiber, bone, cementum are formed in an attempt to restore the injured periodontium that is a repairing part. So when bone is resorbed by excessive occlusal forces, the body attempts to reinforce a thin bone with new bone. This attempt to compensate for lost bone is called as 
buttressing buttressing bone that is a buttressing bone formation it is a compensation mechanism and that is an important feature of trauma from occlusion so buttressing bone formation occurs within the jaw that is central buttressing on the surface it is known as peripheral buttressing this is central or it can be peripheral in central buttressing the endosteal cells deposit new bone which restores the bony trabeculae and reduces the size of the marrow spaces whereas peripheral buttressing occurs on the facial and lingual surfaces of the alveolar plate so depending on its severity peripheral buttressing may produce a shelf like thickening of the alveolar margin which is referred to as lipping which is known as lipping or a pronounced bulge in the contour of the facial and lingual bone and finally we have the adaptive remodeling that is if the repair process cannot keep pace with the destruction the periodontium is remodeled in an effort to create a structured relationship in which the forces are no longer injurious to the tissues this results in a thickened periodontal ligament which is funnel shaped at crest angular defects in the bone with no pocket formation and there will be increased mobility and increased vascularization so what are the symptoms of tfo the first symptom is pain that is periodontal pain because in severe trauma from occlusion there is localized sharp pain or soreness to the tooth in chronic nature uh, the pain will be little okay second can be palpal pain it uh, seen as a sensitivity of teeth especially to cold then there will be food impaction food impaction the plunger cusp effect the plunger cusp effect plunger cusp effect of occlusal interference may produce a functional opening of contact between the teeth which leads to foot impaction then we can also have our tmj pain and there will be signs that is increased mobility this is hallmark of trauma from occlusion can be easily measured by blunt ends of a two instrument which are placed approximately at buccal and lingual heights of contour then force applied to in the bucco lingual direction or we can also use uh, the miller's mobility index mobility 1 2 and 3 then there will be migration of teeth the movement of teeth migration of teeth because of the loss of interproximal contact then there will be a typical pattern of occlusal wear occlusal wear will be there occlusal wear with a typical pattern that is a tooth wear which appears to be greater than one might expect in a patient of that age and which cannot be attributed to any special diet or deficiency in tooth mineralization that is a typical pattern and there will be also changes in the percussion sound percussion sound the sound will be uh, gives a dull sound whereas the normal teeth gives a sharp sound so there will be a dull sound on percussion this difference could be due to the altered width and consistency of periodontal membrane and partial resorption of lamina dura and also another sign is hypertonicity of masticatory muscle hypertonicity of masticatory muscle so that is uh, bruxism and hypertonicity makes the periodontium susceptible to trauma so these are symptoms and sign now let's learn what is a fremitus test fremitus test is the test to detect tfo 
uh, it is the measurement of vibratory pattern of the teeth when the teeth are placed in contacting position and movements to measure the frimitus a dampened index finger as you see the picture here finger is placed along the buccal and labial surface of the maxillary teeth and patient is asked to tap the teeth together in the maximum intercuspal position and then grind systematically in the lateral protrusive and lateral protrusive contacting movements and position so the teeth that are displaced by the patient in these jaw positions are then identified that is a frimitus test so mandibular teeth assessed in edge to edge occlusion so we were talking about maxillary you now the mandibular teeth so the following classification that is the class 1 frimitus class 2 and class 3 class 1 is mild vibration class 2 is easily palpable vibration and class 3 is movement visible with naked eye so frimitus differs from mobility in that frimitus is tooth displacement created by patients on occlusal force and it is a guide to the ability of the patient to displace and traumatize the teeth so in posterior teeth uh, the trauma from occlusion can be detected with the help of occlusion registration strip or using a articulating paper so the pressure points uh, can be detected so the radiographic change there will be a vertical bond loss rather than the horizontal Uh, destruction and root resorption will be there widening of the pedial space at the crest then there will be funnel shaped appearance and angular defects now how do we plan the treatment so the decision to treat the patient occlusion either by adjusting the occlusal surfaces or by the use of occlusal appliances will be influenced by the uh, patient symptoms because we need to Uh, go with the symptoms uh, symptoms can be sensitivity pain on chewing mobility presence of wear facets extent of periodontal destruction or patient's ability to adequately function so all these uh, factors we should take into consideration and if the patient is symptomatic and does not have significant periodontal disease treatment of occlusion may not be indicated even if significant occlusion discrepancies are present if the patient has occlusal discrepancies in addition to periodontal disease occlusal treatment can be considered so the decision to perform occlusal therapy should be made after reevaluation of the patient's response to non surgical treatment such as oral hygiene instructions and root planing okay oral hygiene instructions and root planing should be first planned so mobility and frimitus will often be greatly reduced by these procedures and the need for occlusal treatment may be diminished so an exception to this treatment timing would be when the patient has difficulty chewing or tooth pain when chewing that appears directly related to occlusal trauma so the occlusal treatment consists of basically two basic approaches that is the use of a bite appliances that is bite guard first we should go for oral hygiene and root planing so occlusal treatment is bite guard then adjusting the occlusion by altering the occlusal relationship between the teeth so bite appliances we can give it fits over the patient teeth and creates an artificial occlusal surfaces for the opposing dentition to contact or occlusal adjustment we can do which is known as coronoplasty or selective grinding So selective grinding or coronoplasty is a procedure by which the occlusal surfaces of the teeth are precisely altered to improve the overall contact pattern. The tooth structure is selectively removed until the reshaped teeth contact in such a manner as to fulfill the treatment goals. So that was uh, all about trauma from occlusion an important topic in periodontology. 
uh, there will be lots of questions short notes short essays you need to write the classification concepts uh, your treatment and the fremitus test uh, and the stages that is uh, injury repair and the remodeling all those things will be asked so occlusal trauma is an important risk factor which can increase the rate of progression of an existing periodontal disease so there is a place for occlusal therapy in the management of periodontitis especially when related to the patient's comfort and function and occlusal therapy is not a substitute for conventional methods of resolving plaque induced inflammation so hope you understood the topic trauma from occlusion so i'll come up with another topic in periodontology thank you